Alison has, um, is an engineer by profession, but later on in her life she came into teaching at the high end at university level, becoming a professor at Aston University in Birmingham here. So she is very interested for the, us in the ringing fraternity who um, are, w want to teach ringers to benefit from the knowledge that the world of education might have to offer us. So with um, no further ado, I'll pass it over to Alison. Thanks, Pip. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you some thoughts and please do ask questions, but there is a stop of questions at the end, so we'll see how we go. So, what does the education sector, particularly the higher education sector, perhaps offer, offer ringing? Some of the comments, I'm not going to say are mandatory, they're not compulsory, but I think it might be worth just thinking about them in the course of what we're trying to do in the world of teaching ringers. Um, there's a huge amount of theory, a huge amount of practice, obviously, in the education sector. And compressing that into a few tens of minutes is an impossible task, but I'll perhaps just give you a taster. Before I start by thinking about what does the actual Central Council say on the top of its website about new ringers. Um, could you become a ringer, it says. And if you can ride a bike, you can ring. Okay, interesting. Well within the capabilities of most people, all walks of life, age 10 to 80, keeps you fit, makes a glorious sound, and then why are ringers actually doing it? It may be their church involvement, some do it for pleasure, and some for the fun of doing it and the people around, and some people obviously are just intrinsically interested in it when they get going, um, but that's probably not the motivation at the start. But it's worth bearing those comments in mind. I think they're quite an interesting set of comments. And obviously it's really about attracting new ringers, sort of people who would be educating and training in ringing at the starts of their ringing career. So in good professorial fashion, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I might get a chance to tell you something, and then if you're really, really lucky, or really unlucky, you might hear it again a third time. But <laughs> knowing me, you probably won't hear it a third time, so be rest assured. So... Thinking about our new ringers, I want to touch on 21st society, because the world we live in now is very different from previous generations. And I know that a lot of ringers and ringing teachers have had a lot of experience in life. I won't be ageist, um, but society is changing in the tools that we use in society, and just these things. We're not up with chalkboards anymore. What about their motivation? We've touched on that a little bit, come back to that. And then into the education bit, which is really why I'm here. And then how we meet the expectations of the ringers, and perhaps some provocative thoughts about ringing and what we can learn in ringing from what the education sector does. So, first of all, obviously, and one of the things that we're all thinking about is how we can attract new ringers, but I'm not going to touch on that today. The education sector is equally thinking about that, but I think that's a talk, or several talks in its own right. And I'm going to really concentrate on the early stages of ringing, handling bells, but of course advancing and then thinking about lapsed ringers and bringing them back. Um, it really could be more talks on top, but I'm going to concentrate on the new ringers and just touch on the others a little bit later. <coughs> So if you've got new ringers who are thinking about learning ringing, I'm sorry about the quality of this, what do they do nowadays? They go onto Google, and I just Googled bell ringer, and that's what comes up as one of the key pictures, well that's what came up in January. Okay, fine, that's what bell ringing's about if you go onto Wikipedia, and that's what 99% of youngsters will do nowadays. I'm going to be a bell ringer. That sort of picture and image might still be around. That's from a lovely painting down in Foy in Cornwall. Or, of course, the inevitable <laughs> Christmas card. They might have gone across the channel to where they have some nice carillons and you can actually see the bells up at the top of the tower. Um, some of us from the Central Council went there on a trip in the uh, May period last year. Or they might even have seen something like that. 
If they've been to a Carillon, and there are a few in this country, that's actually in Southern Ireland a few years ago, they might have actually heard a Carillon. So what sort of music? We've said on the Central Council slide at the start, they might like the sound, but are they going to be expecting tunes, as you would do, from a carillon? Or actually, it's probably more like what we, would, as ringers, would expect to hear from a tower, something like that, um, down in Evesham. But in reality, as ringers, what they're probably going to see, first of all, are a bunch of people standing around like that. And what are they hearing and what are they seeing and how does that compare with their expectations? And by the way, the church is over there. This is across the churchyard, if any of you have been to St David's. So that's the sort of image of what ringing is going to be about for newcomers. And let's just think about their society that they live in, if they're at school or they work. Huge online availability of data and information. As I've already mentioned, they go off to Wikipedia to find out about things. Typically, youngsters, very short attention span. And anyone that watches television, media, it's instant makeover. Anyone can have a garden in five minutes. Anyone can have an improved house in five minutes. Anyone can dance, cook, sing. Gareth Malone will have you singing in no time. People who didn't think they could sing or cook or dance, it's all feasible very quickly. And you only have to do a little bit of it, and your cult hero, probably up in the media, in spotlights, earning stacks of money, is not in that position. And equally, and I'm very familiar with this, anything that's vaguely technical, numerical, scientific, engineering, equals difficult. When you see that, hear that on quiz shows, on radio, on television... Anything out of the periodic table, what is C in a difficult science question? Oh, it might be chlorine. Oh, sorry, but it was a difficult question. No, sorry. And bell ringing does have that sort of image of being vaguely technical when people start to see it. <coughs> so, coming on to the education sector in the 21st century... Education now recognises that it's not just the next step, but education goes on through life, for work, for leisure, and you're gaining skills, gaining experience. It's not just a one-off. When you're at school, gain the skills and use those skills through 30, 40, 50 years. Students, particularly in the higher education sector compared with when with all due respect, most of us were at school or thinking about higher education or were in higher education, the students are still individuals, much more individual in many respects. But they are very numerous. Huge, huge numbers. Widely variable, very diverse backgrounds, very different experiences and discipline backgrounds. Huge availability of information. And a critical thing, I think, for ringing, and it's what we see in engineering and science in the university sector, manual dexterity and practical skills are vastly less than particularly boys, but even girls, would have had when I went to university. Picking up saws and hammers or anything mechanical, never, never done it, and they're coming into engineering programmes. And that's an issue for ringing, so just manual dexterity and manually doing things, very different way of thinking and doing things nowadays. Their thumbs are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> my, my thumbs don't do what children's thumbs do, but anything more than that, no. And it's very much the image of the students being customers. We're on, we're, if you're on a train nowadays, you're a customer. You're not a passenger. You're a customer in education as well. And for a degree... They're paying typically £9,000 a year. And anything cheaper is probably seen as lower quality. Um, it's quite an interesting concept. It's capped at 9000 by the government. But overseas, of course, prices are much higher in some parts of the world, like the US. But it's an interesting thing, bearing in mind what Pip was saying earlier on about subscriptions to the organisation, the, the association. Um, quality, in many respects, equates to price or price to quality. Facilities in HE are now pretty good. 
the days of creaky blackboards, um, creaky desks that scratched you, splintered, etc., etc., pretty well gone. And also, <coughs> students expect their material and their teachers even to be available 24 7 all day, all weekend, emails, web material, teaching material, videoed, recorded. It's not just when they come and sit in the lecture theatre and hear people talk. Effectively, the teachers are supplying the education material and they also expect the teachers to supply the certificate at the end as well. And in a way, the government is encouraging that in this country. Everyone's got to succeed and it's the university or the school that has failed if the children do not pass. And as a consequence, there is a huge amount of education theory. And that's really been built up, I understand, since... The Second World War, in a sense, most of it has come from there. And I'm in dangerous territory because I'm not an expert. I had to go through an education course when I first went into the HE sector, which was interesting. So this is where I picked up some of these thoughts. I'll just touch on some of the theories. I can't go through all of it. There's books and books and books of it. How many of you are actually in the teaching profession? I'm in very dangerous territory. Hmm, yes, I thought that might be the case. <laughs> By definition, a teaching course probably attracts you to ringing as teaching as well as teaching teaching anywhere else. So, am I way off track? Should I go home now? <laughs> Oopsie, sorry. So let's go back to the motivation because if you want teaching to teach and be respected and appreciated by the students, you really have to think: what are they trying to get out of the class? And particularly in ringing, they're not likely to be there because they've sent to do Latin or Greek or whatever it was that we were sent <coughs> to do in the past. They actually want to achieve. And we have to get over the basic facts, key techniques, the basic terminology, the jargon. They have to learn and assimilate what they've been told. And equally, the best way is to give feedback and reinforce so that the students know how is it going? Now, sometimes they can tell that themselves, but obviously they need feedback from others, typically the student, from the teachers, may also be other students. So there's key route to learning. They've got to start wanting to do it, otherwise you're on a really sticky wicket then. They've got to learn some basic facts, they've got to get it in their heads and understand it, and then they need to be advised on whether they're going in the right direction, whether they've learnt it. That sounds to me to be pretty fundamental. What about motivation? How motivated are they? There's some nice little grids like this, and education theory and business theorists as well. I've got business school colleagues as well. They love these little four by four grids. Scientists and engineers are much more detailed than that. We can't just have sort of four by four grids, we go into much more. But if you think about them personally, and then their interpersonal skills, whether they themselves are feeling the satisfaction or from them in their own heads or whether they're getting the satisfaction from other people and then are now actually getting personal rewards and are they actually getting public recognition. So it's how are they really feeling respected and recognised for what they're doing? And I like little pictures like this, it's much better than four boxes. Um, what's inside their heads? Do they feel they've achieved? Are they curious about something? Are they interested? Do they get pride in doing something? Or are they just in it for the money, the grades, the career, the exams and the praise? And I think in ringing, this, to me, seems to be the first thing, because you're not going to get money for ringing very often. A few pounds pops if you're lucky for a wedding. Very few people have got a career in it. Um, exams, there's no sort of public certificates. You don't tend to have something for your CV. Might be a little bit of praise, the, well, the grades, uh, as we discussed, I mean, the sorts of things that ITTS is doing, um, of moving that way. So, okay, the, let's get the six of the motivation going, but then actually, how do they learn? How do they assimilate the information that you're giving them? And I like this sort of little cartoon. And I'm sure that in your towers, you would have come across this. And I'm sure that you'll have heard things which are things where you see another person trying to teach or help someone. You think, 
hang on, that poor person is just not going to learn by someone saying, yes, dodge now, dodge now, yes, I said dodge, 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 haven't you learned that the, the treble bob is lead, and then, then dodge again? I'm thinking, that poor person is just then wanting to sit in the corner and look at a picture. They're not wanting someone shouting in their ear about it. But then equally, say, well, go and look at the book, when actually the person wants to talk it through. And in the education sector, this is actually well recognised. There's different classifications, but I think just four <coughs> boxes, four little images of start. Some education theorists say they're more character types in. Some like seeing something, some people like listening, some people like reading, and some people just want to jump in and do it. Yes, please. I'm talking up the notes. Are the notes going to be available for this? Because it's terrific stuff. Sorry, I'm going too fast. No, 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 do as I say, not do as I say. You have the slides. Alison's, Alison's memory stick can be loaded onto Rob's computer so that it can go straight onto the ART website. Okay, okay so we just make sure we do that. <coughs> I'd better just check what I put off Wikipedia for copyright purposes into uh, if it's going on the website. Otherwise, I should be in clink. <laughs> And if you think about it, those four little boxes there, people learning in different ways. This guy Fleming encapsulated it in what he called the VARC model. Visual learning, auditory learning, reading and writing, and kinesthetic. And I think this is quite interesting because if you think of the different types of people with the different personalities and their ways of learning... Some will want to listen, they'll want to speak it, they'll want to repeat it, they'll want to discuss it with teachers, peers, family, friends. Some will just want to look, draw, sketch. They'll want handouts, they'll want things on paper, they'll want to put it on a whiteboard or a blackboard or whatever you've got. Some, some will want to read it and read it and read it in more books, different ways of expressing it, but on paper. They'll want to take notes, as our colleague here is trying to take notes while I'm graduating away. Some will want to copy, some will want quiet, some will want sounds. And then the others that just want to jump in, try it, work in groups with models, test pieces, doodling. They'll soon get tired and they'll want a break. And I think if we think about that, and I've seen it in towers when I've been <coughs> reading, how are we approaching the teaching that we're doing? Are we suiting different types of people that will be in front of us learning to ring. There are theories about age and gender variance, all those sorts of things, but I haven't got time to go into all that today. It's another thing to think about. So learners are different, but teachers, of course, are different as well. If you think about your learning style, how do you learn? Do you then try and use your predominant way of working with the students that you've got in front of you? I hope those who are professional teachers will think, no, I don't do that. I recognise that the students will be doing it different ways. But overall, we have to have some frameworks, but with flexibility, and think about the personality and what the individuals are wanting to achieve and how they're going about it. And it's matching those two together, challenging them, but not overstretching them. Because we probably all realise that if you're overstretched, you just think, oh, God, I'm swamped, give up. But boredom soon sets in, especially with younger people today with this very short attention span. So what about the education programmes that exist nowadays? If you think about it, you've probably seen this in your own lives, but in your perhaps children, even grandchildren. They are incredibly well structured nowadays. Very well defined levels. When I went to do a physics degree at university um, just a few years ago, we were given out one sheet of paper. You're going to do a physics degree. Fine. What was the course? Well, you've got six modules this term. Electromagnetism, light, thermodynamics, whatever it was. Electricity next year. What were the exams? Well, you're going to be a physicist. Electricity, magnetism, light, whatever. What was the syllabus? What was the structure? Well, just go along to these lectures, do these practicals, trog through. All very short. But nowadays, it's incredibly detailed, very well-defined, structured and levelled. Clear start dates and end dates. What are you doing when? What's the schedule within the course? What's the timetable? 
How is it going to be assessed? How are the teachers going to feed back to you? In education establishments, all that has to be defined before you even embark on the course. Incredibly detailed. All the books, handouts, material online, apps on phones. That's what students are into nowadays. Very clear pass-fail criteria. What certificates are coming? What awards are coming? And that's the sort of structure that particularly younger people will have been trained through at school, would have been trained through if they've gone to university or college, and that in an education environment, if they think they're going to come and learn something like ringing, they will probably be expecting some sort of structure like that. And they'll expect to succeed. They'll want the certificate, the presentation at the end. That's graduation down the road in Birmingham. So, the environment where they're actually learning nowadays, it's big <coughs> classes, particularly in the higher education system, it can be hundreds of students in a great hall, in a lecture theatre. Maybe tens, tutorials. If you're still in Oxbridge, in colleges, you might have a few one-to-ones or one-to-twos, but most universities, colleges, education establishments, the numbers are large. Teachers certainly have to be qualified. Modular structure, the syllabus, and all the lessons, lectures, whatever, is very well planned, and what the educationalists call intended outcomes. What are you intending to do? What's the outcome in this particular lesson, this particular module? What are you intending to achieve? What do the students expect to do? What do the teachers expect the students to have achieved? And the students have to be very clear when they have succeeded. It's quite interesting. Very different chain, and very much different from when many of us would have been at university or at school. And I just put this comment in because supplementary one-to-one -one coaching and support one-to-one, -one, which is often what happens in ringing, is very, very rare or it's at a price. We still do have conventional lecture theatres, big great halls and such like, seating three, four, five hundred. Very little chalk. I haven't seen any chalk since I've been at Aston, um, five years or so. But very more, much more diverse teaching environments nowadays. Material on the web, recordings. All students expect to get their lectures recorded so that we can have them online afterwards. Um, I'm wandering around, I've just remembered that you're doing this here and I'm probably out of shot. Um, they want variety, they want hands-on, they want demos, they want to be excited. It's almost as if they're at a theme park all day. They want something to be excited, enthused and go home having had fun, they say. Very, very little note-taking. It's an interesting one. And this is more like the sort of environment where they're doing projects in a practical environment. Maybe computer-based learning, may not be serried ranks like that in a, an actual formal classroom, but on their own, with their own computers, their own laptops, whatever. Coming back to a bit more theory then about how we teach and what people have to learn. This fellow Biggs has done a huge amount, of written loads and loads of textbooks, pops up in the education sector. I'm sure some of you in this room must have encountered work by Biggs. But he's really sort of identify two sorts of knowledge, and it's self-evident, really. The basic facts, the jargon, the rules of the subject. It's learned in lectures, it's reading, it's note-taking, you might have to recite it as a part of the discipline. And it's typically assessed maybe by question and answer, multiple choice, and repeating things to others. But it's the absolute basics. And it's all the sort of thing that we're familiar with in ringing, like jargon. What's the prize? What's even the mechanics of the bell, what's with Sally, what's what, all the bits and pieces we have to think about. It can be passive. Often it's seen as very dry, tedious, rather boring. The analogy I make is with driving a car. You, we all learn to drive a car because we want to use it as a means of transport for getting from here to there. But the first lessons are all about 
the steering wheel, the clutch, the accelerator, the brake, and how you move these bits of kit around to get the car moving and don't stall it again, don't bump into things. When we've learned to drive, that all becomes absolutely subconscious. We just do it. And we're more concerned about what that bus is doing over there, what that bike's doing, what that lorry's doing, and where are we going? What are the signposts? If we're going from Birmingham to Edinburgh, what's the map, what's the route? And we might have a sat-nav shouting us in the corner, but hang on, we're suddenly going south again. The sun's changed direction. No, the sun's not changed direction. I've changed direction. What's going on? That's what's worrying you. So these are the sort of basic facts that you have to learn probably become subconscious later on, but it's what can be in many disciplines very putting off, very off-putting for many, many students. It's boring, it's tedious, it doesn't really seem to sink in without a lot of work. But the functioning knowledge, as Biggs called it, it's building on those foundations. And it's really required, and he quoted in his, some of his texts that it's the essential thing that you actually expect a surgeon to be able to do it, not just know the facts, uh, I think that's a good example. And it has to be learned from photos, from demos, from practicing. And then it's assessed by showing someone and actually making sure that you can do it. You've mended something, you've made something, you've actually demonstrated your skill. It's typically active. It's not the passive. And in student terms, it's often seen as exciting, but it can be risky, thinking back to our surgeons. I think there's a good analogy with ringing there, actually. You don't do ringing without getting to do the practice, really. Certainly, towel belt ringing. Um, and it can be exciting, it can be fun, but if you don't get it right, it can be risky as well. Another bit of theory, deep and shallow learning, and this is sort of related to the other points. The shallow can be repetitive. Can, you can learn a poem, you can go to your lesson, recite it, Tick. Next day, can you remember that poem? No? You've got it in your short-term shallow memory, as they called it. But if you actually learn a poem, for example, I'm, I'm taking it from the education literature here, put it in context, the meaning, the poet, their background, when they lived, what was going on in the world around them at that time. It takes more time. It takes more teaching involvement. It probably needs challenging and probing and questioning to really assimilate the information. But it really does sink in. You ask someone about that poem or that poet in a few weeks' time or a few years' time, they remember the facts, they remember the context, and probably associated with that, they remember the actual poem itself, or at least chunks of it. So that's deeper learning. And again, I think that's got a lot of things about ringing. Just going along to an odd practice, hearing someone chant a through yeah. Treble bob, lead, snap, dodge, treble bob in three, four, on up to back, da -da -da -da. you might learn to recite it, but can you actually put it in practice next week? Now this chap Bloom, another of these educational theorists, you can just think about building your knowledge. Yes, just learning, reciting, recalling things at the bottom, but you go on, he was proposing, through comprehending it, applying it, doing the analysis, doing the synthesis, and evaluating it. Many of you have probably thought and heard that people say, to learn properly, you have to teach it to some, someone else. Somebody's nodding here in the front row. And effectively, that's what you're doing. You're doing the judging, you're rating, you're ranking. And I'm sure many of you, as you've come into using the T ITTS programme, you've thought about teaching someone else. You've actually learned something yourself. And that's the sort of thing you're going up this hierarchy, the, up the pyramid. And it's drawn like this because obviously there's more people have the basics, and as you go up, fewer and fewer people typically have that higher level of knowledge. Now this fellow, David Kolb, said, actually this is all cyclic. Because you can start, some people want to start by doing things, then watching it, some people want to think about it, and you can go around this loop, and the more you do, the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know, and you keep going around this Loop. It's another of these little four by four grids drawn in a slightly different way. <coughs> educational theorists and education teachers will spend a whole lesson talking about this and give whole courses on this sort of thing, but I'm really skating past it. The other thing, and again, I think this is the thing that's changed since my school days and my own university days, it's not just the teacher like I am teaching to you, <coughs> scouting to you, sitting there in serried ranks in chairs. 
The teacher sets the framework, and it's more often now thinking about the context of the learner, what is their previous experience and their knowledge, and exploiting the fact, particularly in larger groups, that the peers around can have lots of experience that they can bring to bear themselves. People who've done different things, certainly in ringing you might think someone knows a bit about music, someone knows a bit about engineering. People have got different backgrounds and can share that sort of knowledge with each other and it helps each other. So peer-to-peer -peer learning is a very popular thing nowadays. And that, therefore that learning can be formal and informal. Going to the pub after ringing, how much time is spent by the ringing Greek geeks talking about what they've just been thinking about and what they're going to do next week in their appeal. And hearing all that is still learning in many respects in that sort of forum. And the teachers can learn from the learners, in fact. What they got stuck with, other ways that they thought about learning. It can be dangerous because there can be misconceptions, but can go both ways. In the education sector, there's effectively two forms of feedback now, and I thought this was really interesting when I started learning about this as a learner rather than just in everyday life. In ringing, we often shouting at people, and some students in ringing actually get fed up and say, I don't like being shouted at by that guy. I don't want to be shouted at. I want to know what I've done wrong. I'm just being told what's wrong and not how I don't understand what I've got to do differently. And what is called formative feedback is that advice, that guidance. Somebody who did something wrong, but actually, what do they do right? How do they change it? How do they think about it? And certainly not to frighten people. There is, of course, the other form of feedback, which is what's called summative feedback. It's a horrible word, I think. Um, but it's actually that formal assessment. And in the education sector, you can't consider what you've been given in advice, say, in a lesson or a lecture during the term as feedback. You can't use that as information to assess people later on. You have to have the formal assessments against the set criteria when you're marking students' work. And it is two-way, because we also get feedback from students about the learning. And I think we've got tick sheets for you to fill in about my presentation here, so you're going to do that as well. So, are we meeting the motives and the expectations of the students initially, which is what we're really thinking about today, but also in their later career? <clears throat> so what were their motives? Let's just go back to what we had on that first Central Council side. Some of them were wanting to do it as a social activity. Some of them were literally wanting to do it as a service to society in their church. And some people just wanted to come along because it was wacky, it was different. They'd heard it and wanted to take part. Unlike something like football, I don't think many ringers will come along because it's the herd mentality. They all want to do it because all their friends are doing it. So it really has to be something wacky, something different that they're coming along for. So what is their starting point? I mentioned that earlier on. Why? Range of ages. Huge difference in educational levels. Many of them will have had different educational experiences. Some will be expecting sort of traditional chalk and talk. Some will expect a different mix of doing things, different styles. And of course, younger people will want apps, electronic means, downloading. And of course, different learning styles they want to learn on their own or in groups. They will all be different. Can't see this very well, but just put the picture in because some will know a lot already or will think they know a lot already. Um, if you, for those that can't see it from the back, this is a board I saw in St David's um, where from 1799 to 1979 um, there were all these members of the Lambert family, two columns of them, um, 20 or 20 more Lamberts have been ringing. So that family, you probably, if you remember that family, you'd have known quite a lot of jargon, quite a lot of experience in the background, if you were a young Lambert in St David's, even up to 1979, you probably had books around, drawings of methods, and got ringing jargon in your family. So young new ringers coming along, what is it? They will have loads and loads of questions. Is it safe? When will the exam be? How much is it going to cost? What's ticket am I going to get? 
How long is it going to take? When am I going to finish? And then once they get going, why can't I use those numbers? Why can't I do it? I'm really struggling. There'll be thousands of questions. You've all heard them, I know. But what do we do? Come along to practice night. I know ITTS wouldn't people do, people wouldn't do this nowadays, but what perhaps, shall I say, traditionally did we do, and what still happens in many places, we just go up to the tower and say, come along, have a go. What sort of introduction have we given them? Oh, go and learn something, and we, there's people learning stuff, and we, we throw that in front of them. This is second night. Okay. Uh, uh, what do I do with that, please? I mean, just a slight anecdote. I remember when I was going to secondary school, 11-year-old, it was when we sat in different classrooms, probably many of you did this for your different subjects. So you as a new 11-year-old went into the maths room and saw all this sort of stuff on the blackboard. And you thought, I'm never going to be able to do that. What does it mean? But of course, that was the upper sixth class that had been in there since morning before you had arrived. It wasn't your stuff. But I remember I was absolutely paranoid that I'd never, ever be able to learn that stuff. I did do A-level maths in the end, and two years at university, so I sort of won over, but struggled. But that's what we do to our young ringers, or any ringers who are coming in to learn. So, the meet of the meeting, I'm running over time, aren't I? What about ringing? And this is where I'm going to be a bit provocative, but hopefully provoke some thoughts in doing so. What is our ringing curriculum? We're doing a lot about the mechanics of belt handling, but I've put down a whole list of things when I was preparing these slides that we could also consider as a curriculum for ringing. Moving on to call changes, method ringing, conducting. Yeah, we probably all think about that. Advanced method ringing, composing, teaching ringers and teaching teachers. Yeah, well, that's what we're here for today. Maintenance. Then how do we teach, advise and guide our young ringers, our new ringers, about the culture around ringing, the guilds, the associations, all the other things that can go on, carry-ons, foundries, the mechanics, handbells, tunes and changes. So there's a whole raft of things which, in one way or another, a new ringer will be bumping into jargon and those sorts of things. But how are we really explaining how it all hangs together in a structured way? And of course, in the education sector, this is all covered in various stages, with a syllabus for each part. The lessons have got intended outcomes, that jargon again I mentioned earlier on, so it's sliced up. Groups are taught together rather than individually. There are clear theory and practical sessions. You don't do a bit of theory while somebody else is doing a bit of practical in the same room and somebody's saying shush while someone else is trying to explain. So there's definite classrooms and practical environments. And there's taught elements and self-taught elements. So how do we really think about that sort of thing when we're teaching ringing and we're expecting learning to happen with our ringers? And of course, in the education environment, you've got handouts, online books. We've got lovely lots of them over there now. We encourage note-taking. We try and avoid rote learning, but we help students through that. We expect a lot of peer interaction nowadays, even to the extent of marking each other's work and assessing and getting involved, getting active. So they see it as fun. It's back to the fun and enjoying it, and what are they motivated by? Feedback, positive, supportive, not beating them up, not shouting at them, using a variety of teaching styles, and it's not just the way the teacher acts and behaves, but actually in doing the practical work, the demonstrations, and then the thinking about the assessment, the qualifications and the certificates that they get at the end that they can use to show that they have achieved. And actually, importantly, particularly for young people, they can show, are they a black belt in judo, have they got grade five violin or whatever, if they go to university, what can they show for their ringing on their UCAS form? Hmm, interesting. And this could be a topic for debate ad nauseam. What are they paying and what do they expect to pay? I've touched on this, but it's just interesting that there are groups, Magdalen College, I'm sorry about the quality of the picture, I picked that up on uh, 
the web group of ringers over in Oxford. So we really do need to think about how we're learning, how we're teaching, all the different types of knowledge that people have to pick up, the basics and to function, so they're not like a surgeon who's only read the theory books. Consistent jargon and consistency. Now, although you want variety, there's nothing more confusing than someone trying to explain said Stedman, sort of saying somebody calling it boxcar, boxcar something, and somebody else calling it castles. How does a student sort of assimilate all that different jargon? They think, is this different? Is it the same? So lots of different things to consider. But what teaching material do we have? It's really improving dramatically. But is it consistent? Is it helpful? Bearing in mind the variety that people want to use. And how are we considering the different styles that the students have? Can they help themselves? Can they help others using the different styles and ways of learning that they have? <coughs> but don't pigeonhole people. People do actually change the way they learn. They might want to take notes at the start, but then they don't lose them later on. So... Recognise the different styles, but obviously we have to be safe. You can't expect people to say, oh, well, I learn by practice, so I'm just going to grab the end of the rope and not worry about any of that theory stuff about what's going on upstairs. Hangs themselves, hangs other people. So you have to have some basics. And reward and recognise success in some way or other. And I think this is an interesting one. We, what are our expectations of our learners? Certainly the younger folk, their dedication and commitment, perseverance and tolerance is much, much lower than probably people who were being more forced or dragooned or dragged along to the tower in the past. They will vote with their feet quite quickly. And this is a fascinating one. Certainly in the education sector, they are very, very compartmentalised now. Is this in the exam? Will I be marked on it? If not, I am not interested just want to know what I have got to do that I'm going to be marked and assessed on. And I think that's an interesting one with youngsters coming into ringing. So, I'm going to conclude it. A few comments towards the end. That's the sort of learning, teaching environment in a university nowadays. Really weird, wacky sort of seats that you can move around, people can roll around on, do project work, push out of the way. Do individual work if they need to. But that's the sort of thing that students now expect to have the variety in the different frameworks for their learning. What are we doing? I just leave this as a question about advancement to the higher levels of ringing, the more advanced stuff. And what happens when a lapsed ringer comes back to the tower? Oh, they've had a family, they want to come back to ringing. They did it when they were children or when they were at university. It's more than just what happens on practice night. Whoopsie. Just see what happens on practice night. I'm sure we've all heard that. Oh, come along and just join in. And just see what happens. We don't do that in an engineering environment in a school or a college. Oh, just come along and see what happens. What about the advancement? Look up Padsey for next week. Here's the picture. Or oh, go and find the picture somewhere. Is that teaching? Um, there are courses, yes, but how many of them are taken up? How many people use them? And if we're going to use Go and Learn Pudsey for next week, who's actually going to come? Who's going to teach it? Who's going to be there to help it? Will they ring it more than once? Will they ring it at all if they've looked it up? <clears throat> so what have we actually done to prepare for that Pudsey next week? And returners, are we just going to throw them in with the learners? Or do we throw them in with the experienced people? Was whatever they'd learned, sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button, was what they'd learned embedded well in the first instance? What have they actually forgotten? Just don't make assumptions if they're coming back and throw them in with learners and hope for the best. But these are really separate subjects. I'm just throwing in some provoking and provoking some thoughts. 
And actually teachers learn, need to learn as well, and can do and will do all the way through. And reflection is a term that's used a lot in the teaching and education sector, I find. And these things called critical incidents. How often at the end of a practice we might wind on in the pub and sort of say, oh God, that was hopeless. But are we actually really thinking about what went well? Why did it go well? Why did we manage that? Surprise, touch, spliced all of a sudden when we didn't think we could even bring the basic methods. Or more often, it's probably the other way. We thought we'd bring the touch of supplies, but actually couldn't even get the Cambridge going to start with. What did not? Why did it not go well? And then from the teacher's point of view, I'm being told to shut up, aren't I? What questions are being asked at the next session? You can learn a huge amount at the next session. If someone's asking a question, what was that fluffy bit called? Okay, they haven't even remembered what the Sally was called. So let's think about it. What's been forgotten? So, is it more than ITTS? Pip's been talking about how ITTS is growing, so that's great. I'm not going to continue on that. And just a few more provocative things at the end here. How do we spot nurture talent? My brother likes playing rugger, and he sort of says, God, he's a, I can see he's a rugger player. That youngster over there, he'll make a good rugger player. I'm far too short to play basketball. I'd have to be six foot six. So what defines a potential ringer? How do we spot the talent? I mean, sometimes you hear these comments like, he, she, it's just a natural. But what have we spotted and how are we going to spot the real talent out there when we're looking for ringers and say, what attributes? God, I'm not going to speak to him, he's really a really good ringer. In the same way as you might say, I really need him in my rugger team. I really need them to play basketball. God, she's, she's six foot six. She'd make a really good member of the basketball team. So, think about what motivates your ringers to ring. Consider what it's costing and the outcomes that we're expecting. The cost of one-to-one -one teaching, it might be voluntary, but that's, that's still a cost. The structured frameworks, the stages, training of teachers, ITTS and more. Using much more about peers learning with each other. Pip, I think it was you touched on Facebook and learners learning from each other and enjoying doing that. That's effectively what they're doing in the jargon. What facilities and learning aids are we using? And I can do a plug for my session this afternoon when I'm going to talk about facilities and such like a little bit. What are the outcomes, the awards, the certificates? And what's the external visibility and recognition for what we do do? How does the public see it? And I will finish there. Thank you very much, Pip. Sorry to say that.